Week after week, my client, Naomi, looked at me like she wanted to fire me. But she kept coming back. It was distressing. I felt like I'd been cast in the role of therapist by a director who hated my performance. Why is she doing this to both of us? I thought every time Naomi took her position on the couch and eviscerated me with her withering gaze. I wanted to say, I suppose you're wondering why I forced you here today or sometimes just what? But I didn't. Snarky and confrontational is not who I am as a therapist. At least that's what I told myself. But whoever I was, I wasn't enough for Naomi. And she showed up every week for years to remind me. It was like Groundhog Day. Every session was a repeat of the last. She'd present a puzzle I couldn't solve, something like, no one can ever love me. And however I'd respond with empathy, humor, an interpretation, a reflection of her doubt, an identification with her despair, a deconstruction of her irrational beliefs, no matter what technique I used, CBT, EFT, LMNOP, even if I just listened quietly, her next line was always the same. What am I supposed to do with that? At times like this, when it feels like my clients are rejecting me, not just my efforts to help them, but me, I remind myself what my acting teachers would tell us in drama school. You are enough. They wanted us to believe that we had within us the capacity to be anyone, even the characters who seemed far beyond our reach. Of course, I learned early on as a young actor that Unlike my drama teachers, and very much like Naomi, not all casting directors believe you are enough. <laughs> I've elicited eye-rolling, yawning, and looks of palpable dismay the moment I entered the audition room. One guy went so far as to respond to my introduction, Hi, I'm Mark O'Connell, by glancing at my headshot, giving me a once-over, then declaring simply, No, you're not. That's what it was like to share the therapeutic stage with Naomi, like an audition that allowed only one possibility. I was wrong for the job. So one day, as I anticipated and dreaded my session with Naomi, I was surprised to recognize an emotion burgeoning inside. Hate. I hated that no matter how hard I tried, no matter how far I reached, I was never enough for her. And I hated that I felt hate. Hate wasn't me, especially not the me I tried to portray in my therapist headshot. But at the same time, it was a relief to connect with this feeling. It was liberating, even delicious to identify it. Hate, hate, hate. On the other hand, as Naomi would say, what was I supposed to do with that? She already hated herself and believed everyone else hated her too. As a child, her father trumped every personal achievement she shared with him with a more impressive accomplishment by one of her siblings. She was bullied all through high school whenever she sought attention. And as an MFA student, her, her mentors incessantly picked apart her technical imperfections while they praised the natural talents of her peers. She did not need to feel hated by yet another person in her life, especially not her therapist. But then again, I thought, perhaps my own hatred of being endlessly scrutinized and dismissed by her could help me to join her perspective and to access her. After all, it wasn't Naomi that I hated. I liked her. I thought she was clever, funny, talented. I hated the dilemma in which we were both stuck. So... Naomi entered our scene that day, as usual, with a sneer that proclaimed she was sure I would fail her yet again. She had just been denied a much-coveted job, and she dropped that piece of news like bait before retreating and punishing silence. My cue to feel like a lousy scene partner. But this time, rather than overcompensate for my inadequacy with forced jokes or clinical advice she could get from Instagram... I tried to stay in the feelings, as my acting teachers would say. I allowed the chill of failure, hers and mine, to tingle through my body. Then I took a risk. Sometimes it feels like you hate me, but don't know how to say it. I relished saying the word hate, inviting her to participate in the pleasure of, of expressing provocative feelings. You hate me because I can't give you the job you want, but you don't say that because you know it sounds irrational, so you, you stay silent and 
give the hate to me? Now, I said this not from on high or with blame, but with a sense of empathy and possibility. Well, sure, she shrugged, but I don't know what to do with that. I mean, it's not like I can just go around telling people I hate them for not giving me what I want. Maybe not, I said, but at least we can talk about it. How much you hate me. We both smiled. Something opened up between us. Now, in future sessions, when she'd shoot me that look, she'd catch herself and say, oh, I'm doing it again, R and I. I'm being her. Her is what we began to call that version of Naomi that believed no one could help her and hated anyone who tried. We described her like a drag persona. She didn't need a wig or contouring to slay me with that withering warrior princess realness. All she needed was that signature glare of hers. As it turns out, she first directed that look at her mother. Whenever she would fail to help Naomi be self-possessed in the face of her father's diminishing remarks, she hated that her mother could not empower her. And now, as her mother's health was beginning to decline, and she seemed to slip further and further away, Naomi hated herself for feeling that hatred. Now, painful as it was to construct this narrative, she seemed relieved to be sharing it. We collaborated on bringing it to life with curiosity, compassion, and whimsical references to RuPaul's Drag Race. Success! After years of rehearsal, I was finally good enough to play Naomi's therapist. And then she fired me. Well, not exactly. A few weeks later, my husband and I got the miraculous news that we'd been chosen to adopt a baby. We'd have to go out of town for several weeks to be present for the birth. We'd been cast in the roles of our lives, dads. I gave all of my clients the, the option to do remote sessions for that period of time. And many of them took me up on it, but not Naomi. She said she'd been thinking about taking a break for a while now and this seemed like a good opportunity to try that, so that's what we did. And that relentless feeling of failure I could not seem to shake with her returned. At least I had my new rewarding role as a parent to look forward to. <sighs> the moment our son arrived, the doctor handed him to us, and as he screamed and screamed, I held him and thought, I'm your dad. My love for him was instant and illimitable. And I like to imagine he felt the same way, but the thing about infants, especially colicky ones, is that, like Naomi, they don't let us know when we're enough for them, but they are crystal clear when we're not. As the sleepless weeks became months, that sweet little chub chub screamed inconsolably through the night. It was like sandpaper rubbing up against my brain. I have heard that baby cries are used as a form of torture, and I totally get that now. It was like my son was saying to me, dude, you're not right for this job. You can't help me. Running on no sleep, I rummaged in the dark in search of wipes and diapers and formula I forgot to prepare as his cries of disapproval escalated higher and higher than I thought humanly possible. I wanted my own dad to remind me that I was enough. He had died 20 years earlier. I wondered how the heck he had managed to comfort me when I was a kid. No matter how miserable I was or how much I took it out on him, he'd often respond with something like, you'll be okay, Marco Polo, or you'll get through this, my boy. Then he'd reenact my tantrums, not mockingly, but as a way to invite me to transform my distress into something playful. For instance, he'd use my screams as inspiration for little plays like Godzilla, the musical. <laughs> I vividly remember feeling held by him, not just with his arms, but with his warmth, his creativity, and his sense of hope. Tapping into those qualities seemed beyond my capability. During those early months with my son, I was just too exhausted, too trapped in my own self-doubt. But then one day, while trying to recognize myself in the bathroom mirror through bloodshot eyes, I thought, well, maybe my dad felt just as, as defeated as I did now, only rather than collapse and failure, he used his own exhaustion and, and self-doubt to understand me and 
offer me comfort. In other words, exactly what I had done with Naomi. I suddenly appreciated that my son was even more trapped in a maze of, of exhaustion and desperation than I was. And that with my dad as a guide, I could offer us both a way out. The next time our son held auditions for the role of midnight diaper changer, rather than fear defeat, I imagined my dad buoying me up with his playful spirit. I looked at my son's red screaming face and I said, I know you hate this, my boy. You probably even hate me right now. And I get it. I'd hate me too, <laughs> but we're gonna get through this and it's gonna be okay. Then I sung my British rock star version of Five Little Monkeys which I will spare you now. He did not stop screaming the first time, but after weeks of engaging him in this affirming and playful way, he gradually calmed down during diaper changes. Eventually, he even responded to my efforts with an obliging giggle. Sleep deprived as I continued to be, I held on to the faith that I was enough for him, that my identification with his helplessness could help me reach him and that by trusting my imagination, I could help us both. I also began to accept and, and appreciate that his gratitude for these efforts might never be obvious to me in my lifetime. Then something unexpected happened. I was suffering from a really bad case of baby brain one morning as I barreled into a coffee shop, clearly having gotten dressed in the dark bright orange sweatpants, green flannel shirt, and very possibly an argyle sock static clung to my shoulder like a sash. As I walked through the door, who should I make eye contact with but Naomi? Uh, I thought, this is only gonna confirm what she's always known about me. I'm a hot mess. But I smiled nonetheless, dropping into that warm, playful, dad character I had discovered was in me. Later that day, I got an email from Naomi. It read, it was nice to see you today. I've been thinking about you. I wish that I had thanked you sooner for all of your help. You sat with me with warmth and care for years, despite my often being silent and inconsolable. Without a doubt, you have improved my life. And for that, I will always be grateful. I'm not sure exactly what happened that night, but I am sure my son screamed and that I did not respond to him perfectly, but I knew deep down that he wasn't trying to fire me with his ear splitting cries. On the contrary, like Naomi, he was trusting me with a job to be with him, to validate his feelings, and to invite him to dream of possibilities he could not imagine on his own. <laughs>